My name is Larry, and I have the creative impulse. Phew. This is Jerry. This is Wayne. This is Dave. And you are listening to the Creative Impulse Podcast. We, have a, uh, we had a poll, Larry, um, uh-huh. on how to pronounce your last name. Is it Nocella, Nocella, or Smith? <laughs> it's technically Nocella. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> well, I guess we know. So it's Nocella. Because you don't want to be called no seller when you're trying to sell a book. How many um how many novels? For, first of all, the novels that are actually available to the public now are they self published? They are self published. I did try to find an agent for a really long time, and it was I just found it very frustrating and um, not too exciting. Uh, just because after a while, I felt like you know if, if these things I write are like. Um, you know, as people say, they're like my baby. So I was like, you know, what I tell my baby, you know, try to fit in with the other kids so people will like you. You know, that's not good advice for a kid. So I felt like that's kind of what I was trying to do with my books to make an agent like them. So I'm really glad that the, you know, thanks to technology for on-demand printing and also e-books, you know, that you can now self-publish. So they are all self-published, and um, they are called Where Did This Come From? is kind of what I call an environmental thriller. It takes place in a fictional South American country, and um, their the native people's land is coming under attack. Uh, then there's Loser's Memorial, which is a um, story about uh, a down-on-his-luck guy um, from America who ends up in the Iraq war and then also at the same time a guy from Morocco who ends up being kidnapped and accused of terrorism uh, which he had nothing to do but it was just people trying to collect the reward and then the most recent one is the Katrina contract and that's about that was kind of inspired by the mess of 2005 when New Orleans got wiped out and uh, people were just waiting for help that never seemed to come or it took so long that they um, had to fend for themselves. So it's inspired by that and uh, how uh, wealthy people may be able to afford their own private extractions and what that could lead to. Well, uh, Blackwater, was that an influence here on that story? Uh, in in my books, I actually call them Red Fire. Uh-huh. It's um, obviously inspired by them. Right now, I'm just trying to... Uh, write as quickly and as with as high quality as possible. And so to that end, I'm uh, uh, writing novels. I, that's the medium that I like to use, but I'm open to anything that uh, the, the muse guides me to. So uh, right now I'm uh, working on a couple more thrillers to go with the ones I've already done, but I also am trying to inject maybe a little humor, a little goofiness, to uh, fit my personality a little bit more. <laughs> um, well, you're talking about, you know, your muse, wherever your muse uh, uh, leads you. Continuously, your muse leads you into, like, social commentary. You seem to be taking yeah. things that are going on in the world, and then you just el- elaborate on them in, like, to a uh, kind of absurd extreme. Would that be a fair view of, of what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would take it as a as a compliment, just because uh, my muse is the world, uh, everything. I mean, good, bad, uh, you know, and all in between. Everything just goes into my brain and, and just gets mixed up and then comes out. I do. I guess I do do a little bit of commentary, maybe a lot, just because, you know, growing up I was inspired by, uh, say, Pink Floyd, The Wall, and <laughs> that type of artwork where it's like, you know, it's entertaining, but it also has a message, too. If it's just entertainment, then it's like, well, that was neat, and then 10 minutes later, for the most part, you forget about it. Even if it's intended as just entertainment, I think sometimes it'll have some aspect of human nature that you um, take away from it. Roger Waters had a very, has a very political bent himself. The sewers are clogged with the greed of powerful men. 
I was definitely inspired by him. I guess in as I continue going forward, though, I'm trying to make it more universal and, and just like about universal struggles and and stay away from anything too specific because you know if you get too specific, then in a few years um, people will forget you know whatever specific issue you were talking about because it'll have moved on to news and whatnot. We'll have moved on to something else. Mm -hmm. It becomes anachronistic. As artists, do we have a responsibility to to comment, or or is it or if we're not commenting, are we just being self indulgent? And is it okay for us to be self indulgent as artists just to have fun? Yeah, I would say it, it's okay to do whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, if it's art, you know. If you, you know, I, I think if if we had to comment, then it might get boring. And I guess what I mean by that is uh, the reason I'm kind of straying, trying to push more towards the universal is so that it's it reaches more people. And uh, because if you get down into the nitty gritty and the specifics and say, you know, uh, I mean. People don't watch C-SPAN for a reason because it's kind of dull, you know. Even though it it can be important and is often important stuff. There's a cool yeah, there's a cool factor to your. Yet people to, read. I was gonna say yet people read Ayn Rand for pleasure. I know. So yeah, does that. actually, yeah, I, I think she might be a unique case. Yeah, though, it's kind of an anomaly, that, isn't like, it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, that's a great point. That's that's a good, uh, in, interesting challenge. Because, uh, yeah, she's a unique case because she writes fiction, but it seems like her main goal wasn't to, you know, entertain with a story at all. I mean, that said, you know, I did like The Fountainhead on more, on, much more on the level of, you know, it was Howard Rourke yeah. struggling as an artist. Mm -hmm. So on that respect, you know, I was like, oh, this is a cool story, you know, an underdog fighting against the machine. But as far as, like, you know, her political stuff, I'm... I'm not on board with a fair amount of it, you know. Yeah, I think with the Fountainhead, it leaned more towards the story and and championing, you know, creative the creative spirit. And then with right. Atlas shrugged, I think it got more, you know, into the political philosophy side of it. Yeah, definitely. And I think the story suffered because of that. In writing in in writing in fiction, that's a means of of making your ideologies much more palatable or easier for general consumption. Yeah, I know. Actually, whenever I hear opinion or agenda, it almost sounds like a dirty word sometimes because so many people use it as an insult, like, oh, you're just trying to promote your agenda. So that's why I always try to make sure I, I tell the story first, but I don't try to, like, hide anything. And, and I guess the other thing is I also try to stay focused on the human aspect. Like, yeah, this maybe this guy agrees with me but in this particular situation maybe that's not the best thing to do and i guess the other thing is that's why i like my characters to um that's what makes them unpredictable is because i give them room to do something out of characters because you know like say someone is extremely anti-violence but then you know they're put in a situation where they have to you know, defend themselves or straw dog and, scenario. Yeah, and it's just like you know, you know, it's just kind of interesting. You know, when you put them in that situation, I, I guess at the end of the day, you know, the the primary purpose is to entertain. Mostly, what I'm trying to do is just be compelling. You know, not if I just was about agenda, then I would just write nonfiction opinion books. But I don't think they're, at least again, this is just my opinion. They're, I don't find them as interesting. It also feels like on some level your uh, your stories are just cool as action stories, action movies waiting to be made. Yeah, I hope so. That's that's that would be awesome. An inspiration to write was sometimes in the beginning of a movie, just real quick, you'll see it say, um, based on the novel by so and so. Based on the novel by Larry Nocella. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. Nocella. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. <laughs> Yeah, like that—that that would be so cool just to see that on I like an it. actual film. I guess you, you have to be careful with the opinion stuff because people there is a lot of like people trying to sneak their opinion on you, or you know, like say, "Oh, well, what about this situation? Wouldn't you agree with me then?" What if the government, you know, suddenly was taken over by robots? Wouldn't you agree <laughs> that we should all own our own nuclear weapons? In my world, I try to stay away from that. 
you know, you have to also be realistic, too. So it's kind of humbling, too, when you're writing a story that, you know, if the characters come to a situation where you're like, you know, oh, I guess I wouldn't have done that or I would have messed up here or something like that. You let it flow like the spice, right? You just kind of like, exactly. He who controls the spice controls the universe. Even just the very act of creating as an artist, are you are you commenting? Can is it possible to create and and not comment? Does it come from some? Is it always going to come from someplace intellectual or or with some sort of agenda, even if even if it's subconscious? I don't know that I would say that for everybody. For me, maybe just because I kind of think in some ways I'm a smart ass. I'm a jerk, <laughs> and I, I just always want to get my dig in. But I think for some people, uh, art is, I'm thinking, maybe a form of dance. It's them playing creatively, so to speak. And I'm not saying one is uh, better than another. I think I could definitely use some more play, and that's that's what I'm leaning towards with the works so I'm um, in the process of writing now, is uh just maybe having a little more fun and not being so doom and gloom. Although, you know, doom and gloom is its own kind of fun. It's funny that you I, use the term. Oh, that you said the term. Use the, the word play. Uh, a mm -hmm. friend of mine who's a writer, who's also a writer, another friend of mine who's a writer, also talks about uh, this idea of playing. She says writing and art are opportunities to to play with ideas, you know, and play with other realities, play with possibilities. I would agree with that a hundred percent. And you know, there's some. I guess it all depends on the individual. It's been said before about horror movies, because I can never understand why I watch horror movies, even though I enjoy them, uh, other than they're, they're usually more surprising than, say, a rom-com. Because <laughs> in a rom-com, you know what's going to happen at the end. The two main characters are going to get together, and their two friends are going to get together, and everyone's going to get married. But in a horror movie, you never know what's going to happen. And I kind of like that. And I think for play like some people also like live inside the characters you know i don't know that i do that maybe i do but i think for some people you know with even good or bad like sometimes they're fat man sometimes they're a villain and it's just them kind of living in a way that they probably shouldn't in real life you know either because the characters you know say hannibal lecter or is batman and if they tried to be batman they would hurt themselves you know We'll return after these messages. I've got all of these art supplies and nothing to do with them. Hey there, Chuck. Why don't you try the Creative Impulse Podcast? My name's not Chuck. Much later. Say, you were right. The Creative Impulse saved my life. That's great, Chuck. My name isn't Chuck. It is now. <laughs> <laughs> the Creative Impulse Podcast. Motherfucker. What kind of things did you read when you were younger? What kind of things were you into back then? Good question. I really like the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Did you ever, you know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, hell yeah. I love some Choose Your Own Adventure books. I love those. Yeah. Choose Your Own Adventure books. Uh, the, this is a book series that started in the late 70s and went to the late 90s. These books were the biggest deal back then. Now, video games weren't what they are today, so kids had to kind of get their imagination fix a different way. How these books work is that you're on a plane, you're, you're, you're on a trip uh, going somewhere, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you'll read to the next page, you get beamed in to a spaceship. So at any given page, you read where you're at, what's happening to you, and then it gives you a list of three options underneath with three different page counts. So say you want to go up into the spaceship, or you want to go down into the spaceship, or left. If you turn left, you can turn to page 16. You get to page 16, and you navigate through the book that way, so you can choose, quite literally, choose your own adventure. Yeah, those are great. I mean, I I sometimes would feel ripped off, though. Like, I would make a decision that I thought was right, and then the aliens would kill me, or something like that. <laughs> Did you bookmark them? I used to bookmark the pages. <laughs> and just go back, which is cheating, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if I ever did that, but that's a good idea. I wish I could do that in real life most of the time. Do you have any of your, do you still have any of your children's adventure books around, and the actual uh, physical copies, the hard copies? Nah, no, nah, I, I gave them all away. I always, I, I try to um, just give them to a library or, you know, somebody who can use them once I'm done with them, unless, like, I have a, a shelf with just 
classics that I need to look at every once in a while, but it's very small. When, when did you realize that you were a writer? At what age did you realize that you were a writer? Or that you had something um, to say? Even if you didn't write, did you have something that you, there's something inside or, of you? Or that you know? wanted to express yourself in, in, you know, in that medium? I don't know exactly. I've always written, but I don't, I didn't really say, okay, now I'm a writer until really just a few years ago, because for the longest time I was just exploring different mediums. Like, uh, you know, I tried to be a musician, but I was, you know, I, I always wanted my way. I didn't want to like really listen to someone else. <laughs> And uh, it was the same when I tried, you know, a long time ago, had a big VHS camera and tried to film a, a TV show and had all my friends and then, you know, yelled at them and made all enemies of my friends and stuff because I, I just found that I'm I'm a loner. And I was like, you know, well, I'd like to be creative. What's going to fit my uh, annoying personality? And I said, I'm a writer. Yeah, I won't annoy anybody. So I guess that was it, just by process of elimination. It wasn't like a bolt from the blue or anything. I experimented with a lot of different things and then finally realized I had no friends left, so I had to be a writer. <laughs> but it was it was the most uh, direct form of exp expressing your ideas. I mean, there's nobody standing in your way. It's just you and the canvas. Like, it's, it's hard to get more direct than that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, you know, I, I would say it's for everyone writing because I mean music looks cool like be in front of people and have them appreciate it right then where you're writing you're like wow that was great and then six months later maybe someone will see it or whatever but yeah for my personnel I guess that was it it's like finding out about myself and then that, it, that's where I ended up did you did you feel like the same thing that was driving you to write and to make music? Do you feel like there was a similarity in what was driving you to do both these things? Was 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 there the same inspiration for both, and and did that change over time? I don't know that it changed. I mean, it, it was just I want I felt creative. Getting to the to re, to the real root of it is just I want to leave the world a better place, and you know maybe contribute something that will you know, mean something to someone, either, you know, just direct words to help them or to inspire them or something, or just like a really cool piece of art, you know. And when I say art, I mean writing. I, I use the word art, like, very general. I guess that was the thing, is just I wanted to to just, you know, push some buttons creatively and see what happened. One thing I noticed about your uh, your writing style it's it's very visual. When you when you before you write, do you actually see the images, see see the events in your stories unfolding uh, before your eyes and your or more appropriately inside of your head before you actually put them in the paper? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I try to I try to see it, and then almost and this could be just you know growing up as the the MTV generation, but I do think very visually that way like you have to be specific so you have to describe what the scene is like or at least I should say the important parts of the scene because say if you're running down a hall from someone trying to kill you you're not going to notice every detail so, but what are you going to notice and, and the thing I've learned about writing is that getting specific getting down to the not to every detail but to important details or unique details that you know remind you of a place are you sometimes surprised by what you produce do you sometimes are you just as surprised as your reader might be or might be or your viewer yeah actually i am and that's that is the most fun part of writing is when you put together a character and then you put them in a situation and then i i'm a strong believer in outlining but I, over time, I think I've gotten better, and I'm always trying to get better, always trying to be humble and, and improve. But what I'm getting at is um, I outline, but then I let go. So it's kind of like I, I wind the situation up, and then I let it go. And if it gets out of control and it seems like everything's going too crazy, then maybe I'll step in and outline again. The surprise part is the best, is when you wind them up and you let them go, and you think, okay, they're roughly going to end up there. That's usually like almost a guarantee that I would keep it in a story because you know you cut pieces out, you put pieces in. But if it's surprising, I'm almost guaranteed to keep it in because that's the best. 
I kind of know where they're going to end up, and so I think of how would it, this character get to that point? Like, would the, how would they get to this point where they, you know, almost succeed in their mission but fail? And I think what's what's most fun about that is uh, building those surprises into characters. So, the, the meaning like they'll act one way for a really long time, but then they'll they'll do something that's out of character just enough to make them real. Because we all do that, you know. We're like, you know, and those are the most puzzling and interesting parts of life is when you say, oh, that, that person would never say that. They would never do that. And then you, you have another friend come up and say, oh, yeah, well, they did. They really did. Like, I can't believe it. And that, that, that's just interesting. And if you read that in a story, I think that's, that's what keeps it moving. It's just, if it's, there's always a little surprise for you. Yeah, I guess I, I know where they end up. And one of the techniques I've learned or developed or whatever probably read about somewhere is actually writing backwards and what I mean is I think of the end and then I think how they would get there but I don't force it because you don't you definitely don't want to force it because then it'll just it'll read flat you know you know it's funny when you talk when you talk about these things it sounds like self-reflection but it sounds like you're doing something more than self-reflection you know in order to be uh, you know a great artist you have to there's a lot of self there's a lot of that self-reflection involved but it sounds like you're doing something more than that because you're you're not only reflecting about yourself, you're reflecting about your play. You're doing it's back to that word play. You're playing with different with scenarios, of possibilities, of think with 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 figures or personalities that exist beyond you. Not every character is is me, but I guess you know you can always see a little bit of yourself in someone. And I guess I always just wonder, like, what would I do in that situation? is definitely in the equation, but then I always try to remind myself, okay, well, this person isn't me. They, you know, this person's more assertive or this person's a jerk or this person, you know, doesn't care what someone else thinks. They don't care to be nice. They're in power and they want their way and and that's that. And they will roll over someone if they need to. So it it is definitely self-reflection. I guess that's why I like it. It's just, I think in even though I'm opinionated, I uh, uh, writing has helped me see things from other people's perspective. I think because you just you have to put yourself in their shoes, and then you kind of after a while you you know for some things you start to go yeah I guess I can see where they would be coming from with that, you know I guess I can see, you know if if they you know say grew up in an extreme extremely you know, violent home or extremely poor home or whatever it may be that they would turn out differently than I did you know being basically fortunate you know growing up do you spend a lot of time observing the people around you and does that does that feed into your stories in some level yeah I, I hope I can say that without sounding creepy <laughs> well you know that disclaimer at the beginning of some movies where they say none of the events or people in this film are, are based on actual characters in real life although that's a lie usually yeah, when I see that, I always think that's bull. That's bull crap. I always see that disclaimer, and I'm like, no way, that's not true. This, and I, it just, it does seem like just a thing to to cover their legal butt. All characters appearing in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons living or dead is purely coincidental. When when you read some fiction and characters feel flat, do you think that's because the writer did not connect with that character in an emotional way? That there was some d- distance between the writer and the character that he's trying to uh, to present? You definitely don't want to put too much, at least in my opinion, you don't want to put too much of yourself in there. Or else, you know, well, just, I would say, you know, skip, stop being so indirect and just write an autobiography. Because some of those can be, you know, I've read plenty of those that are exciting. So, I mean, it, in the end, if you're writing fiction, I think you have to put the fiction first. That's interesting. I don't know. It's funny. That's an interesting question. Lane's question stirred something in me because I, for the long for a long period of time in the art that I was producing and in the things I was writing around my art, I didn't put a lot of myself in there. I was I would I'd sway away from that. And now I'm putting more and more in it. But you're right. There's this but there's this kind of balance that you have to achieve. That I well with and it varies from piece to piece with how much of 
the personal you and how much of the commentary you and are you going to put in there? But it it seems like it's very difficult to produce art without openly engaging the reality around you. It seems like it seems like you're um, you're doing your art a disservice when you when you neglect what's around you and also even the, or even the legacy of the artists who have gone before you. It seems like. You know, and don't people recognize that? I mean, isn't that why some art has a coldness about it? Well, sometimes it, it depends I mean, on what you're going for. But that, I mean, if it's unintentional, that sometimes characters don't feel fully fully rendered. Could that be a part of it that a person, the creator, is keeping themselves at a distance, or they're not looking, from their art. or they're not? It, but it doesn't have to come from self. It can come from uh, it can come from ex- other external force. It can come from character from other people around you. It can come from pre existing characters. It can. There's a lot of different. There are many places to derive that warmth. It's it's like a sweet spot. It's something that you don't you don't know you have that warmth till you find that warmth. But I guess it's just a matter of determining where you're going to get it from. No, that's awesome. That's a great conversation. I think you you nailed it with just saying sweet spot. I and mean, that's that's pretty much it with anything. You just you got to have that balance of you can't put yourself in it too much, but if you leave yourself completely out of it, then yeah, you're not you you are kind of maybe doing a disservice. So you're not putting your whole your heart into it. And that's what people want, you know. I I mean, everyone has their opinions. I certainly do, but you know, I, if I read something, I want to, you know, know where someone's coming from. You know, as long as they're not, like, say, threatening to kill me, then I, I want to know, you know, like, you know, why do you feel that way? And if you feel strongly about it, come on, you know, we're two people, just, I'm an adult, you know, just tell me you feel strongly and why. And, you know, I'll decide if I think you're being silly or not. I would just, I would rather, you know, person just be honest and... You gotta be true to yourself. You gotta be true to the game, as Ice Cube would yeah. say. It don't stop. Yay, yay. I work on a comic which is primarily about um, about a villain, and I think a lot of a lot of the gauge that I use in writing for this particular character is that I think of like the opposite of like what I would do like in in, in normal life. Sometimes that could also be a barometer. I would I would imagine how you could write a character. Like what would I do, and then think of you know then this character would probably do the opposite. Yes. I will do the opposite. Does a lot of research go into your stories, although they're fiction? To answer the question a lot, I would say no, I'm afraid of research. Because that, like I said earlier, it's like journalism looks hard, you know, if you do it, try to do it right. But I do do a little bit, like, you know, what would happen here? And with that, I actually talked to a friend of mine with Katrina. You can see in the back, I talked to a, a guy who used to be in the Navy and um, asked him a few specific questions about, you know, what would happen here? Is this realistic? You know, is this, could this happen? And I guess, I guess, just kind of felt him out for his opinion on, like, just so it wasn't, like, so that someone watching it would say, oh, no way, that could never, ever, ever happen. Did you get into the inner workings of Blackwater? Did it inform your writing? No, no. Well, I, I've seen a few documentaries, mm-hmm. so maybe that that bled into it. But I, I pretty much that part I just kind of made up. Like I thought, you know, how would this work if this? Because the basic concept made sense to me. You know, where like say someone with crazy wealth would say, you know, I never want to be like those poor people in New Orleans waiting for waiting for help, and then it just never comes. So then I was like, well. I wonder if they could pay someone to just come get them, and then what would that look like? What would happen? And then it just snowballed and became the Katrina contract. Uh, did you say that you've written both fiction and nonfiction? Um, yeah, well, I, on my blog, I sometimes will throw in an opinion piece, but lately I've been really straying away from that and just um, trying to keep the opinions subdued because I could just be so opinionated it would annoy everyone including myself but not really I thought about it though but journalism looks really hard like, <laughs> to do it right but some of my favorite books are nonfiction, like the the book Born to Run uh, I forget his name Christopher McDougall and I've, I like John Krakauer 1984 was great because I think that was the the prototype um, path fiction, half-commentary type of thing, where the story's pretty good, 
but I don't think people remember the story as much as they do all the the prophetic things that were well laid out. When I first started, that would have been my goal, but I guess now I'm leaning more towards just trying to be entertaining, and because I think for the lot, a lot of times people pick up whatever lessons. I don't want to sound like I'm preaching or teaching even. But people like take away from a work whatever they're going to take away for the most part. Well, you don't so wor- guess- you don't think an author has to worry. You, you shouldn't be so concerned about what the end the end the end uh, takeaway is, but just tell your story. Right. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of where because I like action films, so that's why Katrina Contract was like another step in my continuing you know journey. I felt more action where Losers Memorial was a little heavy on the, you know, citing, like, different political trends and whatnot. But I think it was still a good story. I still kept the human element. But Katrina, I think, was even better in that respect. But um, the other work I like is A Clockwork Orange. And that's just because, um, I don't know if you've ever read the book. I know most people have seen the movie. But I was interested in that because there the movie did not include the final chapter of the book where uh, the main, well, I don't want to spoil it, so maybe I shouldn't say, but it completely changed the tone of the whole movie. Like, if you read that final chapter, there's there's something being said there that was not said at all in the movie. And um, But I, what I really liked about the book was the sort of unusual slang and there was just no help at all. Like, when you start the character, Alex is using all his funky terms, like, you know, my drew. Thou globby bottle of cheap, stinking chip oil! Come and get one in the yarbles! If you have any yarbles, you eunuch jelly thou! Well, ultraviolence is a pretty easy one to figure out, but he used all different kinds of slang. And when I first read the first chapter, I was like, what the heck is this? I don't know half of these words because he made them up. But after a while, you start to understand the context of this. It just was written really well. Did uh, 